The second lecture will focus on the fundamentals of geodesy, coordinate systems, and map projections. This background is essential to understanding how GNSS work and how to effectively design a survey. In this lecture, we will focus on some of the fundamentals of geodesy and how we can determine the coordinates of a point, horizontal datums, and why it is important to understand what datum you're using in order to ensure that your data aligns with previous data properly. We will then discuss the different vertical datum systems and different ways of determining height. Finally, we'll cover coordinate systems and map projections. One of the significant challenges of geodesy is how do we accurately determine the location of a point on Earth? And more importantly, how do we d accurately transform this information from a curved surface to a flat system with a coordinate system? In GPS, point positioning is accomplished by taking satellite observations from a curved, smooth mathematical surface and transforming those to a flat surface with a coordinate system. There are multiple ways that the Earth can be modeled. Two of the common types of Earth models are the biaxial ellipsoid and the geoid. We'll go over each of these two types of Earth surface models later in this lecture and over the preceding lectures to follow. Geodesy is the science concerned with the exact positioning of points on the sur surface of the Earth. You could actually extend this definition to include positioning points on other planets such as the Moon or even Mars. In point positioning, determining the coordinates of a point on land or at sea is done with respect to a coordinate system. Essentially, we're attempting to link an unknown position of one object with other objects of known position. This can be done via triangulation of reference to known points, such as geodetic benchmarks, or in reference to GPS satellites and permanent receiver stations. Point positioning can be done many different ways, which can be broadly categorized into, into traditional surveying and GPS surveying. Each of these surveying techniques are further complicated by the complexity of the geoid. The geoid itself is a surface along which gravity is always equal to and to which the direction of gravity is always perpendicular. So essentially, the geoid is an approximation of global mean sea level. Now, it's important to note that the geoid may also be referred to as Earth's, quote, true shape. While the geoid may be the best model of the Earth that we have, it's also highly irregular in size, shape, and the orientation and magnitude of the gravitational field. In other words, it is highly dynamic and changes across space and through time. There are many different reference surfaces that we could choose to apply to the Earth. The three surfaces that we'll focus on for the purpose of this course are the ellipsoid, geoid, and the true topographic surface. Notice that there are differences in where the ellipsoid, geoid, and tropographic surfaces have their origins or centers and how complex each of the surfaces is. The origin, complexity, and other properties of each of these three surfaces have important implications for determining the location of a point on Earth's surface. The simplest model of the Earth is a biaxial ellipsoid. The biaxial ellipsoid is a mathematically smooth figure of the Earth, but because the Earth is not perfectly spherical, the, the ellipsoid has a semi-major axis and a semi-minor axis. The ellipsoid itself is defined by the semi-major axis and a flattening parameter, which is computed from the semi-major and semi-minor axes. The next topic we'll cover is horizontal datums. A geodetic horizontal datum is essentially a reference biaxial ellipsoid that has a well-defined origin and axis orientation. There's eight parameters that uniquely define a geodetic datum. Uh, A, B, which remember are your semi-major and semi-minor axes, as well as your X, Y, and Z, and your X, Y, and Z vectors. There's a large number of horizontal datums, many of which are specific to different regions, nation, 
or even localities. The standards and procedures for defining these specific datums, horizontal datums specifically, vary widely. There's no consistent standard and procedure for any given datum. When using multiple datums, it's important to note that the coordinates for a single point will be different for different datums. This difference is because the measured coordinates are all relative to the initial point or origin and ellipsoid parameters of the datum. While some datums fit better regionally, others are more appropriate and have a better fit globally. Perhaps the most common series of global horizontal datums is the World Geodetic System, or WGS, which was initially developed to allow targeting and travel over long distances. Here are some examples of common ellipsoids that serve as a foundation for many different datums. You won't be asked to memorize any of these parameters. However, these, this is purely for your information. Remember, a horizontal datum is defined by an ellipsoid and an axis of rotation, including the origin and axis orientation. The three common Earth datums are NAD27, which stands for North American Datum of 1927, NAD83, which stands for North American Datum of 1983, and WGS84, which stands for World Geodetic System of 1984. NAD83 and WGS84 are very similar, however there are significant differences between NAD27 and NAD83. While NAD27 and NAD83 use different ellipsoids, the most significant difference is that NAD27 uses a non-geocentric axis of rotation and is centered at Meads Ranch, Kansas. On the other hand, NAD83 uses a geocentric axis of rotation that is centered at the Earth's center mass. Here we can see how the different origins of NAD27 and NAD83 affect how well each of the datum aligns with a true topographic surface. Differences in horizontal datum parameters can create havoc when dealing with historical and modern data, or when analyzing data collected in multiple datums. Here we see the impact of data mapped using two different datums. In this case, the map on the left has been created using a more recent WGS84 datum, and the map on the right was created using the older NAD27 datum. Remember that the NAD27 datum is centered on Meech Ranch, Kansas, and is not or may not be an appropriate datum for all locations outside of Meech Ranch. Here's a portion of a U.S. topographic map created with a NAD27 datum. Focus on the Highland School, which is located in the center of the map. In this case, the school is located 700 meters east of longitude line 541, and 275 meters north of latitude line 4789. Mapping the same information using the updated WGS84 datum, we can see that the school shifts significantly. Using the WGS84, the same school is located 541 meters east of longitude line 541, and located 350 meters north of latitude line 4789. This means that by simply switching the datum from NAD27 to WGS84, the school shifted its apparent location 159 meters west and 75 meters north. This apparent shift is simply due to differences in the datums and can be smaller or larger depending on where you're looking and which datums you're using for the different mapping. Here's another example of how different datums affect the apparent location of a particular school or feature. In this case, the Highland School once again has been mapped, only this time using a variety of different datums, which causes the school's apparent location to shift significantly. Notice particularly how large the shift is for NAD 27 Greenland datum and for the Bermuda 1957 datum. This example highlights the importance of understanding what datum your data has been collected in and how it's stored. 
Here we can see the magnitude of shift caused by simply shifting or switching from NAD 27 to NAD 83. The ISO lines on the map are meant to represent the magnitude of shift in meters when you switch from NAD 27 to NAD 83. Now, Meads Ranch, Kansas was selected as the center of NAD 27 datum for a variety of different reasons. It was the approximate center of the continental U.S., although this is not precisely. In addition, surveying at the time was done by line of sight, and Meads Ranch, Kansas is a vast plain with a large hill in the center of it. By setting up the initial point at the top of the hill, you can actually maximize the distance over which you can survey before the curvature of the Earth starts to affect your surveying, and you would have to move the survey station. As mentioned earlier, mapping data in two or more different datums can cause significant shifts in the apparent location of a point. In this table, you can see how large the shifts in location can be when comparing WGS84 to more region-specific datums, such as those used in Japan, Europe, or Africa. It's also important to note that there can be significant shifts between different updates or iterations of seemingly the same datum. So in this map, we can see the magnitude and direction of mismatch between the original NAD83 datum and a 2011 updated NAD83 datum. It's important to note also that versions such as the 2011 NAD83 datum may not be labeled appropriately in all GIS and other software. Make sure that you know what datum your data is being collected, mapped, and analyzed in. Now that we have an understanding of horizontal or XY direction datums, we'll integrate the Z component of positioning. This Z component of positioning is done using a vertical datum, which has implications when determining your height. So a vertical datum is a surface of zero height in reference to some point or set of points with known elevation. GPS and GNSS both give the horizontal and vertical datums, and it's important to know how each of these affects the data quality and output. More specifically, a vertical datum is a set of points with known heights either above or below mean sea level that is determined by a tide gauge near the coast or the shape of the geoid away from the coast. One of the early vertical datums that was widely applied, widely accepted, was NGVD 29. This stands for National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929. It was initially generated from 26 coastal benchmarks. However, one drawback of this datum is that it is unable to resolve elevation differences of surveys extending between different benchmarks. These benchmarks were spread out all across the eastern U.S. and through Canada, and they didn't match up. This led to the realization that the ocean is not flat, but rather that mean sea level varies across space and through time. Another factor that was not accounted for with the initial NGVD 29 is plate tectonics. NAVD 88 was introduced in 1988 as a replacement for NGVD 29. Now NAVD 88 stands for North American Vertical Datum of 1988 and it uses a base monument or initial point which is located at Father's Point in Quebec, Canada. The rest of the benchmarks that make up this datum are referenced relative to this base monument and all of the elevations within this updated NAVD 88 datum are given as orthometric height relative to the local geoid. So to recap, NGVD 29 elevations are defined by the mean sea level at the co closest coastal benchmark, but remember this assumes that sea level is uniform everywhere and that there's no plate tectonic drift. However, NAVD 88 is a newer vertical datum where elevations are given as the orthometric height in reference to that Father's Point, Quebec initial point or origin. And they does account for plate tectonic shifts.
GPS natively measures the elevation as the ellipsoidal height, which is then converted to orthometric height by the receiver unit or external software. And we'll get into the height measurement shortly here. In North America specifically, NAVD 88 elevations tend to be less than NGVD 29 elevations and NAVD 88 elevations tend to be greater than GPS elevations. This map shows the vertical differences between NGVD 29 and NAVD 88 vertical datums and really underlies the importance of understanding what datum you're using. Remember that the Earth's true shape is called a geoid and that this is the surface along which gravity is always equal and perpendicular to. Now it's also important to note that the Earth's gravity is not uniform across space or time, but that gravity plays a role in determining the orbit of GPS satellites. This underlies why it's so important to have an accurate knowledge and representation of the shape of the Earth. GPS coordinates are natively measured at, in geodetic latitude, geodetic longitude, and height above the reference surface. In the case of GPS, the height is natively measured in reference to WGS84, and then is subsequently converted to whatever datum you specify within the unit. Geodetic coordinates can be transformed into Cartesian coordinates if the ellipsoidal parameters are known. The geodetic longitude and latitude can also be transformed or projected onto a rectangular grid of northing and easting, which is particularly useful for mapping purposes. Here are the parameters of the WGS84 ellipsoid. You won't be asked to memorize any of these numbers or parameters. This is simply for your reference. As mentioned earlier, GPS receivers natively compute height relative to this WGS84 ellipsoid. Keeping in mind that the WGS84 ellipsoid is mathematically smooth or simplified surface of the Earth, the actual height above sea level can be different because there is likely to be mismatch between the simplified ellipsoid and the more complex geoid. In other words, these surfaces may not line up 100% perfectly. There are several different measures of height which you need to know. First of all, the height above sea level is the distance between the local sea level, as represented by the geoid, and the true topographic surface. Second, the geoid height is the distance between the geoid surface and the ellipsoid surface. This is essentially a measure of how much the geoid deviates from the simplified mathematical ellipsoid model. The orthometric height is the distance between the topographic height and the geoid surface. This is oftentimes the measure of height that we're interested in knowing and the one that GPS corrects for. Lastly, the ellipsoidal height is the distance between the topographic surface and the ellipsoidal surface. This is essentially a measure of how much the true topographic surface is different from that simplified model of the Earth. Here's a map of the geoid height. Negative values as indicated by cooler colors indicate that the geoid is below the ellipsoid as is the case across much of North America actually. Here you can see the Yellowstone hot spot where the Earth's crust is actually being pushed upward by a plume rising through the Earth's crust. Moving focus to California, you can see that the San Joaquin Valley is an area of tectonic subduction which shows up as a darker blue and moving up into Canada, you can see that Hudson Bay shows up as an area where the geoid is significantly farther below the ellipsoid. And this is because the crust hasn't rebound, rebounded completely upward following the retreat of the glaciers during the last ice age. Now GPS receivers measure the ellipsoidal height represented by little h in this diagram and they correct for geoid height, represented by N in this diagram, to get the orthometric height, big H, which is the height above mean sea level. We're most interested in many instances with the orthometric height or height above mean sea level. 
Here's another example of how the different surfaces compare and relate to each other. The three surfaces are essential to understanding height are the ellipsoid, the geoid, and the topographic surface. Now that we've covered horizontal and vertical datums and how we determine height, we need to cover coordinate systems. Simply put, a coordinate system is a set of rules for specifying the positions or locations of points. These rules must include a well-defined origin and set of vectors. Now, coordinate systems can be classified according to reference planes, orientation of axes, and origins of the horizontal and vertical dams to which locations are referenced. There are three broad categories of coordinate systems. One, celestial coordinates are relative to other objects in the galaxy and are defined by the declination and right ascension. The second one is global Cartesian coordinates, which are for the whole Earth, are defined relative to a celestial object or objects, such as the Sun or another star. These coordinate systems are relative to the location of the observer. In other words, they're observer-based. There's also projected coordinates, which are more local than celestial or global Cartesian coordinates. Projected coordinates are the latitude and longitude coordinates coordinates which are earth-based or ecliptic. Now geodetic coordinates are often what we're interested in. Geodetic latitude is the angle from the equatorial plane to the vertical direction of a line normal to the ellipsoid. And we'll go into each of these in the next few slides. Geodetic longitude is the angle between a reference plane such as a principal meridian in a plane passing through the point being measured. And geodetic height is the distance from the reference ellipsoid to a point in a direction normal to the ellipsoid. Note that this is not the same as ge geoid height. The geodetic height is commonly referencing a point on the topographic surface. Remember that both geodetic latitude and geodetic longitude are measured angles and the geodetic height is actually a measured distance. So here we can see a diagram showing how geodetic latitude is a measured angle specifically from a plane through the equator. Similarly, this is a diagram showing how geodetic longitude is actually a measured angle in reference to some meridian. There are several different ways that coordinates can be recorded and reported. In this course, we'll ask you to be able to convert coordinates from one of these to the other two and vice versa. So you can convert between degree, minutes, seconds, degree, minutes, and decimal degrees by thinking about one degree as one hour. So there are 60 minutes in an hour and 60 minutes in a degree. There are also 60 seconds in a minute. So Degree minutes seconds is a common approach where the degrees provides the coarsest level of position followed by the minutes followed by the seconds, which are increasingly precise. If we take the seconds and divide by 60, we get the decimal portion of the minutes in our degree minutes answer. Additionally, if we divide the minutes in the degree minutes answer by 60, we get the decimals for our decimal degrees answer. To convert decimal degrees to degree minutes, simply multiply everything after the decimal place by 60. And to convert the minutes in our degree minutes, simply multiply everything after the minutes decimal place by 60 to get the seconds. The length of a meridian is the same at all latitudes, regardless of whether you are at the equator or at the poles while the length of a parallel is dependent on the latitude. Higher parallels, either closer to the south or north pole, will be shorter than parallels closer to the equator. Here's an example of how the length of one degree increment along a meridian and one degree increment along a parallel at College Station are not the same physical length on the ground. So when you go through the calculations here, 
you'll find that the length of one degree along a meridian at, in College Station is approximately 111 kilometers, whereas the length of one degree along the parallel at College Station is smaller at only 96.5 kilometers. The next topic that we'll cover brings together ellipsoids, datums, and coordinate systems. So map projections are essential to transforming the coordinates measured on the Earth's curved surface to a flat map. There are three broad categories of map projections. Each has its advantages and disadvantages by maintaining or distorting one of four key map properties. These map properties are shape, area, distance, and direction. You need to know what these different types of projections are, so you need to know what a cylindrical projection is, a azimuthal projection is, and a conic projection is. However, you won't have to know which of them distort shape more than area, more than direction, more than distance. Here's another example of how each of the three categories or classes of projections with an example of a flat map of the sphere on the right. So you can see how they distort different properties with those different projection types. Some of the primary coordinate systems that will run across in the U.S. are geographic coordinate systems, universal transverse mercator or UTM, state plane or SPC, and public land survey system, PLSS. Geographic coordinate systems are commonly divided into 180 equal portions. So in geographic coordinate systems or GCS, lines running around the earth from east to west are called parallels and represent latitude whereas lines running north to south along the Earth are called meridians, which these represent longitude. Now, given that the system is composed of 180 equal portions, one square at the equator would cover an area of 4,773.5 square miles. While GCS are useful for course positioning, they tend to be or for more precise location within the squares unless you break those squares further down. If we break those squares down into smaller sections, we can improve the positioning precision and accuracy. The order of these units from largest to smallest is degrees, minutes, seconds. So as I said earlier, there are 60 minutes in a degree and 60 seconds in a minute. Each second equates to approximately 101.3 feet. It's important to note that the grid is constant in the east-west direction but is not constant in the north-south direction. UTM is perhaps the most common cylindrical projection that you will come across. UTM stands for Universal Transverse Mercator where the earth is projected onto a cylinder tangent to a central meridian. Now distortion is minimal at this central meridian which can be moved around the Earth by simply rotating the cylinder. A general rule of thumb when dealing with cylindrical projections is that distortion increases with increasing distance from the standard parallels. In other words, for UTM, distortion is minimal along the central meridian and increases as you move away from this meridian. The UTM system is composed of 60 zone numbers, each one designating 6 degrees of longitude. Each of these strips is centered on a meridian of longitude. Now, by dividing the Earth into multiple zones and rotating the system to a different central meridian, UTM is able to minimize distortion while maximizing global coverage. Each UTM zone, remember, is 6 degrees wide and runs in a strip from essentially north pole to south pole, or pole to pole. So in this system, the reference latitude is the equator. So in this example, say we're interested in determining the UTM grid location for Lake Erie, which is in the Midwest 
The UTM zone number representing the longitude for Lake Erie is 17, and the UTM latitude band letter is T. Now, it's also important to note that if you did not want a precise band letter, such as T, you could actually simply designate this as north or N. The central meridian of each UTM zone is referenced as a location of 500,000 meters east. So if you're interested in a location within the same zone, but west of this meridian, you simply subtract the distance from your location from that of the central meridian, which is set at 500,000 meters. Conversely, if you're to the east of the central meridian and also in the same UTM zone, you can actually count up from 500,000 meters to your current location. Therefore, if you have an easting of 400,000 meters, you know that this location must be 100,000 meters west of the central meridian by simply taking the difference between 400,000 and 500,000 gives you the offset. The UTM zones range from about 167,000 meters wide at the poles to an increasing 833,000 meters at the equator. Here's an example of a complete UTM coordinate reading. Now, you must have all this information to be able to precisely and accurately determine your location. However, you may run across instances where others have provided you information where you don't have all this information, in which case you need to track down some of it. Now, the UTM zone number is listed first, followed immediately by the UTM band letter. The UTM band letter ranges from C to X, excluding letters I and O. Letters C through M correspond to latitudes between 80 degrees south of the equator up to the equator, increasing from south to north. Letters N through X correspond to latitudes starting at the equator and actually going up to 84 degrees north. So it's widely acceptable also to simply provide a N or S for north or south. Either way works fine, but the C through X approach provides a greater level of detail on where to initially start looking for the easting and northern coordinates provided. The easting and northern coordinates follow the UTM band letter. It's vital that you put the units of your easting and northern coordinates as well as the label which coordinates is easting and which is northing. Here we have an example of UTM coordinates. So in this case, the coordinates provided are for the Texas Capitol Dome in Austin, Texas. So you can see the latitude and longitude coordinates in the lower right and the corresponding UTM easting and northing coordinates for the same location. Note that the easting and northing coordinates or UTM coordinates and the latitude longitude coordinates are in the same datum. So they are both using NAD 83. However, the UTM coordinates, they have also specified what UTM zone they're in. So they specified 14 R. This would also be acceptable if it were 14 N. That wraps up our introduction to geodesy coordinate systems and map projections. The next lecture is going to focus on traditional surveying techniques, followed by fundamentals of GPS, so beginning to get into how the actual GPS or GNSS systems function.